All right, Warrior. All right, so let's let's do, do the shortest recap here. Like, yeah. there's a lot of stuff you've been through right now, but you had a breakthrough moment when you found out you weren't alone Correct. through a pretty hardcore trauma. All right, go ahead, because we're just jumping in. Let's just jump okay. in with Denise Bard, the fucking warrior, warrior <laughs> musician. All right, go ahead. Well, I'll give you the background. So my um, my mother was 16 when she had me, and she was addicted to drugs. Uh, my father was 18. He was addicted to drugs. I grew up from like, I think my earliest memories are about three or four. And uh, I remember her saying to me that the only reason why I was there was because she was raped. So I had that growing up, you know, to live with and stuff. So um, I, so basically, I, you know, I grew up facing many forms of abuse. My mom, I guess her addiction just got so bad that she thought it was okay to use me as a form of payment for her drug abuse. Um, you know, I, when she wasn't doing that, I was, you know, beaten. And I learned this is somebody else in a warrior position can understand this. But uh, as I was growing older, and I would get hit, I learned if I laughed, she would stop hitting me. So the harder she hit me, the harder I laughed, or and the quicker she was done. Um, but, you know, I faced the whole with her telling me that she hates me, wished I was someone else. Um, oh, gosh, that, you know, nobody ever would want a kid like me. I deserve everything I get. I mean, the whole gamut of stuff. Um, but the 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 kicker that started me to really make my move into professionally speaking was about, um, well, it was a couple years ago when I went into a Zoom, not even a Zoom, it was an online group for um, abuse survivors. And I was sharing a little bit of my story. And I said, you know, I kind of said, my mom, you know, sexually abused me. And I thought I was just alone. And here the 60 year old woman later connected with me and said, you are not alone. There are so many of us out there. And it did, it took me like six months to kind of swallow that and was like, Oh my, I don't even know where to go with this. Like it just, I had to really sit with that and kind of like figure things out. I mean, it was great to hear, but it was also something where I was like, oh my God, like, what do I do now? And then about six months ago, TikTok, we're all on TikTok, we're all scrolling and I get, you know, I get suckered into all the messages too, but I get on the TikTok of trauma survivors. <laughs> And it was a young woman who I think she must have been early 20s. And she, you know, it was her, the background music. And she typed on there that um, her mom sold her for drugs. And just the pain and the, the, I just felt it. I felt it through that screen. And it was like, you got to fucking be kidding me. And so I was like, you know what? I'm not going to be afraid anymore. I'm just doing it. Fuck it. Let's go. Let's go dive right in. And I just started, you know not being afraid to talk. I, I started to share my story even more and I wouldn't leave things out. Well, you know, d depending on the audience, I would kind of gauge as to how much or how, you know, little detail I was, but, um, that I would share, but no, I am, um, full force now. I think nobody else should feel that they are in the dark or alone on this Island, that there are plenty of us out there with, um, ways of coping and dealing and, um, all that. How, you, we have a lot to unpack in that yeah. already, but as, as far as when you started going in through coping, I know that you said the one thing, laugh at pain. So mm -hmm. that way that person will stop. We'll also get into a lot of mom stuff. I have a feeling. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So what was your coping style? What, how did you like try to deal when you had all of this damage going on? Like yeah. what was your, your survival system? Well, it, um, it's interesting because I recognized it more so in middle school, but when hindsight came, I actually had done this my probably all the way. Um, for me, I was really, I just wanted a mom. And so I think in my mind, um, well, I could tell you when I was in middle school, I was so hurting and so wanting parents or a mom so bad that I used to cut out pictures of soap opera <laughs> stars um, because back in the you know 80s, um, I, I put them in my wallet and I kind of walked around like, you know, as if they're going to come rescue me and that's going to be my parents. I had them on my wall. Um, then it, it came to the point where when I was, uh, 14, I went to a, 
nonprofit shelter for runaway abused and homeless youth. And I learned there that I've been doing these coping skills and what they were. So my case manager there, she had always said after therapy, you know, look around you. There are so many people who, you know, really care about you and love you. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? I am like straight ahead. I got to like get through this. I got to survive this. I don't have time for this bullshit. And um, after every time she would tell me the same thing. And I don't know, one day it just clicked. It was, you know, she wasn't telling me to change my perspective on what was in front of me. She was telling me to shift my focus. And so I realized that that's been my, even till the today, I shift my focus. And so when I did that, I recognized that I was latching on to teachers without them knowing it. And in like, you know, wishing that they would take me home and, and rescue me. So when I was doing that, I was daydreaming about it. So when I was home and, and the abuse is going on, you know, I would just think, nope, this is where I'm going. It's just a matter of time. This is what my life would be like. And I would go to sleep with those thoughts. You know, that was what can get me through the night so I can sleep. That was a coping skill. Um, and then as I was younger, hindsight 2020, looking at it when I was younger, I mean, the first teacher was my third grade teacher. And at the end of school, I remember I wrote her a letter telling her how pretty she was, how she was my favorite teacher, and that I wished she was my mom. And so I recognized going back that I was searching so hard for moms that I kind of fairy tale in my head what it would be like. And I, you know, it's kind of what I did anytime I got into that situation of heartache, because, you know, I, I'm 48 and I still like my, there's that hole in my heart for a mom. It just sucks. And there are times where it just wants to swallow you freaking whole. Um, I've learned to kind of not keep myself in that hole too long, but prior it was the only thing I could go to was what would my life have been like? What ifs like dreaming of what it could have been like and, and where I would be now, you know, Oh, I'd have a mom to go to. I have two kids. I'd, I'd be able to go to my mom. Um, these, these coping skills, you know, followed me into my adulthood. And that's one of the things that I think we're always afraid to talk about because they're so childish, you know, and as adults, I mean, when you face trauma, there, there's no childish thing. It's what helps you to, to go through things. So for me, when I was growing up and I had a lot of this abuse, it was like, I would go into my head into these, um, like I said, these storylines in my head of, okay, I'm going to be rescued. This is going to be my mom. She's going to love me this way. I'm going to be taking care of my room's going to, I mean, I went into full detail of what my room would be like. I used to draw pictures. Um, yeah, that was, that was a lot of coping. And then with the hitting, yeah, it was just survival skill. It was to laugh, get hit, just laugh. The harder I laughed, the quicker it was just the quicker it was. So it was, you know, and then you can't escape those um, when they're mentally and verbally abusive to you, you kind of can't escape except again, go in your mind and think about, you know, those fairy tales. I always hated the word fairy tales because it made me think that I was crazy. So when somebody said that to me, I'm like, no, I am not crazy. Don't call me a fairy tale. No, this is my you know, I wanted to call it something different. I didn't want somebody you, to say it's a fairy tale because that I'm not. Do you want not, to know what it's called? What? Do you want to know what it's called? I do. So what you were doing was bargaining. This is uh, in your grieving system, your negotiation system that you had inside your head was a bargaining system. And people underestimate bargaining all the time. When you're going through grief, usually people, um, they have to go through denial, bargaining, anger, and depression. And yeah. people know anger real well. Oh, yeah. And you can spot from a mile away. But bargaining is interesting. So bargaining, even in this book I'm finishing right now, it's connected to one of the enemies within, which is fear. Mm. And fear and bargaining are actually on the same system. But it's interesting because you wouldn't think that. Right. Fear is the what ifs if things were to go wrong. 
bargaining is the what ifs if things were to go right. And so it's on the same scale of imagination and creativity, which shows you have a high creativity, high imagination system, because it became the go to for your survival system. But you are living in a fantasy world that you were creating as an escape from reality which can argue be, arguably be on the denial side of things, yeah. but you had to survive right. by creating a reality that you could survive in or even thrive in. Yeah. This also, I got a couple of questions for you. Sure. When you started getting attached to different people, did you find yourself becoming more of a people pleaser or even in some cases codependent? Absolutely people pleaser. I felt yeah. like if I was, if I was really good, they would want mm-hmm. me. It was like, I had to be, good. I had to be what they wanted. What do I need to be to be what they wanted? Now I say that, but I also went through this um, stage where I was awful, like the sixth, seventh and eighth grade. I was freaking awful. I was not good. I was seeking attention and nobody was giving it to me in the good ways. You're in middle school. And I found that I was getting this attention by getting in trouble and getting detention and staying longer with that teacher. And do you know what I mean? So I went through yeah, I want to be good, but you're not listening to me in middle school. So what do I need to do? So, yeah. yeah. Notice me. Notice yeah, yeah, me. yeah, yes. yeah. And I mean, that was awful because I was not, I was not the person that I am and I wasn't the person that I used to be, but it was no, probably no. one of those stages in life that I, that it was just, I don't want to say natural pro- uh progression, but I think it just fell into that where that was, I don't, how do I say a midlife crisis within my childhood? Yeah. There's no way you can form an identity when you've never been loved and never yeah. been able to be authentic. You, there's no way. Yeah. Like you didn't have a nurture system that made sense. So you created a make believe one based on TV shows or based on whatever it is you'd see around you, but yeah. you couldn't yeah. actually connect to it because you've never had it. So that's a difficult thing. Yeah. But you fell into the security system. I call it the negotiator. Mm -hmm. Like, and so it's a different version of fawning. Fawning doesn't get nearly deep enough as far as what it would be, but it's really not noticed as much because people know fight, flight, freeze, but they don't know fawn that well. No, I don't can go. It goes under the radar all the time. And it's the one where like, you'll move towards a dangerous scenario to try to kind of control the, the, wild emotions of another person or you'll yeah. try to you know be in you're, you're the one who is you feel responsible for the way somebody else is being and so you try to make it so you'll sacrifice something from yourself so that they will somehow either be calmed down or be okay oh my gosh so let me tell you i walk on the treadmill every morning i'm not a runner i just don't run i um i listen to to motivational um speakers um through youtube and um you know, I just listen to the compilations as I walk and I kind of like get, you know, what I need and and how I can help. And when you just said that, it was interesting because I thought, you know what, I tend to take on other people's problems so that they're happy and I'm not. It's almost if like I'm the, my purpose is to help them, not help me, but my purpose, this is my purpose is, is to help them. So I take on all this um, weight that, yeah, like I am just, I'm, I'm just taken from people so that they don't hurt, which sucks because then I <laughs> have to well, miss. Do, do you want to know why it really sucks? Yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. You, you can't be responsible for another person's emotions. I know. And I try to tell myself that too. I'm like, you know what? That's a their problem, not a me problem. That's a their well, problem. But I think we're so... This is, the piece, this is this is why I'm going to give you a couple tools here. It's just because I like you, it. were, you most likely were trying to figure this out through a system that made more sense for somebody else's thing. The anger part, I'm sure people have talked to you a lot about anger, oh, yeah. a lot yeah. about depression and sadness. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you got into a lot of anxiety conversations. Yep. I'm sure you've had all of these things. I don't know how far you've gone into codependency, which I would be hard pressed when we get back to mom if she wasn't extremely codependent with you. Oh, and probably. like. <laughs> Well, it's because she was using you. Yes. She was using you so she could keep using. And a lot of the things that were said to you that no one's ever going to love you, you're worthless, you know, all the things to put you down was also to make it so that you stayed at her level so you would never leave. 
Uh, yes. It's, you know, yes. it does fall into a form of narcissism to try to keep you pinned and isolated. Yeah. So that way they can use you for all the things that they want just to make you feel like you have no hope and no purpose and they are the center of your universe. Yes. She was definitely, she hits the, the, um, the narcissistic and gaslighting. So, yeah. uh, yeah. And, st and, st I don't have contact with her, but I can tell you stories even to this day, what keeps happening. And so, yeah, there is definitely the, um, she definitely needed me. It's, it's in interesting with that is that she was 16 when she had me and her home life was not good. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, um, my grandmother, she has five children, not all the same fathers, kind of one of those. Um, I went into kinship to care with my grandmother when I was four. Um, so I spent from four to 12 back and forth, uh, you know, coming in to there, coming. My grandmother was very, um, she was manipulative and very, um, yeah, controlling. And so when I was with her, I didn't have to worry about sexual abuse when I was with her. I didn't really get like physically abused because, you know, she wanted me to be manipulated. So, of course, I'm going to be always good, you know, um, or I couldn't do any wrong. So she never disciplined me, but I didn't do anything wrong. But when I was with my mother, that's where it was. Um, yes, very dependent um, she, between, you know, the drugs and and the the back and forth of, um, they used to do this thing back and forth where it was like, you know, she's the evil person and, you know, taken sides, right? There was this taken sides thing. So with my mom being 16, there was a lot of, I always said that I was a pawn in a chess game that I did not want to play. And so whatever side had me was in control, do you know? So it was, is waiting for somebody to just clip off the queen, but it wasn't happening. I call them the dark queen and the, the, um, well, I think I used to say the white queen and the dark queen, or queen. Uh, but, um, yeah, it was, it was crazy with the narcissism and codependency. Yeah. So well, these are all, this is all dark triad stuff. Have you done dark triad research yet? No, I can't say I even heard that. You're you're going to start seeing grandma on the other side, especially when it comes to Machiavellianism and uh, psychopathy. So you're going to start seeing these pieces in there. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of, um, you know, maybe psychopath behavior with your mother also. And so, oh, yeah. like, um, when you look into that, there's also uh, they've there's also been some talk to I've listened to Jordan Peterson talk about how they add in sadism yeah. also. Ah. And so. If you get into it, it's no longer just the triad if you throw in the fourth one too. But you'll start seeing Machiavellianism is uh it's about power, manipulation by any means, how to control others by any form of manipulation so mm -hmm. I can get what I want with you, not having any any pushback. Don't put just give I'll retake everything you have and you not only do it, but thank me for doing it. Yes. Like, yeah, yep. so this is grandma on her side. And then you've got your your mom who's going to be doing the narcissism plus the full, full codependency. And uh, a lot of this, too, is is manufactured from massive abuse. There's a lot of argument that um, this is from birth, but I think that this behavior is manufactured. I think yeah. that people are created with the behaviors of the taught. So there was a lot of... Uh, bad things that had to happen to make a teenage girl treat a baby this way. Yeah, I agree. I think that there was a lot of secrets and things. Um, it's hard for me to know. So I, I never tried to deny someone when they say they were sexually abused or that they were um, raped because I wasn't there. And I know how victimizing it is for me when people say that never happened to you, you know what I mean? And they weren't there. So like, you know, my mother claimed that these were the things that were happening to her. Now, I wasn't there, and I can just say her track record has never been on point. I am sure things had gone wrong. I, I would have to assume, but um, but I, I can't deny what she said. But when I when I there's definitely some things that had gone on probably a couple generations, but I, I, you know, I can only speak on mine and then what I saw in that household. But yeah, I was definitely brought into a very chaotic and abusive home as is. So it, it just, I was the, 
just the surprise that came along. And my father, his whole side of the family denied me, which was fine because they had their own issues and he was a heroin addict. So, you know, dealing with one parent was probably enough. I didn't need to deal with the second side of it. Plus she had taught me that he was, um, that he raped her. So for my whole life, that's what I only knew. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, there, and, and same with him. Cause I did, you know, got to know him and stuff, but um, and you, people will wonder, well, if he raped her, why are you talking to him? Well, because she kept going back and forth. Like one day she would date him and, and have me there, but then she didn't. So these were the kind of like his mind games. Don't, yeah. Don't and mind you're mind. like, I, I don't understand, but it wasn't until I was 19 that I had a relationship with him. Um, and we have an on and off relationship, but he, um, the one thing I respect with him is he never denies anything. Like he will own up to his wrongs and you know, everything. Of course, his vision is not that he raped her, but they're both well, a drug well, with addicted. So <laughs> yeah, with the behavior you, after it doesn't. Make yeah. You don't sense. know. So yeah, the, um, I definitely think it was a cycle and I, you know, I know that I broke that and people often ask me that too. They're like, we just don't know how you did it. And for the longest time I would say, I don't know either. But the truth be told is when you were talking about coping skills, that that's how I did. That's how I did. How did I do it? I had to work my ass off in really weird situations, but that's how I did it. I mean, it was not, uh, oh, this is, you know, God touched you and, and now, you know, he, he helped you. Don't get me wrong. I have a good faith, but I also know that it worked my ass off to get where I'm at today. So... Would you say like, a, I'm just a curiosity for your survival system on this with, with this system. Would you say that you lived a majority of your childhood in this, like this, this happy imaginary world that you were in and then you would have to like almost visit the shit show and then you would go back when you were <laughs> isolated back into like, now I'm back in the, the fantasy of what could be or what it would be like. Was it more no. like that or? I no. I unfortunately, I think my happiness was less than the shit show that I faced. Um, okay. You know, I it was those were just pockets of moments gotcha. that I had that happiness, and and the rest of it was really just survival. So if I, um, and it really depended on who was my new person. Does that make sense? So like yeah. as I grew up and and the teachers and stuff, that would kind of make it a bigger attachment or a smaller attachment. And, and I had an eighth grade teacher who was my math teacher. I sucked at math. So it wasn't the subject at all, but she was like my favorite teacher. And this is where my, my uh, motivational speak. The title is three, 30. It takes only 30 seconds to touch someone so deeply that it transcends the time it took for them to say something to you that you needed to hear. So they're the 30 second moments. And when I tell you this is because the one thing she did for me, which is, is less than 30 seconds is what I gravitated to. And, and that was my bigness. So I held on to that. And that's what, when my survival skills were, I have these pockets. When I say I had bigger pockets here and there, that was my big pocket. She had, it, this was so simple. She, um, it was one morning in school. I, my locker was right across from her classroom. I, um, I was bending down, grabbing books out and she was in her class and she called me over. Somebody had come into school to, to see her and I go over cause she's my favorite teacher. And, um, I remember like she brushed my, I had long curly hair. She brushed it off my shoulder and then put her hands on me and introduced me to this person and said, this is my Denise less than 30 seconds, man, that hit me. I've never had anyone like say it in a manner where I felt in like less than 30 seconds, like, oh my God, somebody would want me. Like I am worth being wanted. And when I tell you that that moment, every time I think about it, like I feel it, like I could cry sometimes. That was my chunk. That's my big heavy one where that, that's my, that was my um, go-to for a very long time. And that was heavy enough for me to switch out of, you know, the shit show. And I could go to that moment because it was that heavy for me, that 30 seconds, I was able to shift it that quickly. So if the person was a heavy hitter and I could feel it really heavy, I can shift out of the shit show. No problem. Cause I went right there. 
But if they were a come and go person, like teachers are coming and going, but you have those couple that like say something so pertinent that it just, man, like I go to that now. And I, and, and that's me being vulnerable right now because, you know, I'm 48 when I tell you, like there are moments where those triggers, those flashbacks and like that pit of feeling not wanted. I mean, I'm happily married. I have two kids, but you still feel that not wanted. You feel like, you know, you're facing a shit show of everyday life. And where do you escape? Like in a normal, happy family, like I give my, my daughter, you know, I'm here. And like, she's called me at two in the morning. And, you know, so I am available, right, to her. Well, I don't have someone available to me. So, man, I go to that 30 seconds and I just feel that because I need that feeling. I need that, even though it was pretend or didn't make, you know, wasn't for real, I, I need that. So I can shift out of my shit show quick if I need that 30 seconds to, to be heavy, do you know? So it really depended on who was in my life at the time that I gravitated to. If they were... A heavy, like if I just, I, I don't know if I had this really strong attachment to him, doesn't matter what the shit show was. I can, you know, yeah, yeah. Shit show. Here I am, you know, but then there was other times where there was nothing like there was nothing. And so it was a constant every day, every day. I went into a group home when I was 14. I remember walking through the door because it was the first time I had ever felt safe, like truly, truly safe in my life. And when I tell people that in my speech, I'm like, it's very hard to put into words what that feels like, unless you have felt fear of every second of every day. Like you're afraid to go to sleep at night. You're afraid to wake up in the morning. These are fears, right? It's an every day. That's, that's where I was with shit shows where I couldn't escape that. But those few people that came in and gave me that, you know, so she was one that, that helped me to be able to escape quickly. <laughs> I can like shift that anytime until and and today. I mean, that's sad, not sad. It's just, you know, quite embarrassing at 48, but I understand that it's not my fault. It's what I needed. There's a lot of things. I also see your defenses you still have up for this. Like, cause you, um, uh, you, you're doing this for safety still. And I, I'm just going to say, you know, for me, you don't have to do that because yeah. I see you. Like, I see you. You don't have to um, guard me. But you've been doing that even in this. We're like, you know, it's sad. I mean, it's not sad. And yeah, this is why yeah. I'm doing it. And, well, it's okay because. And, and that's fine. And, and this is why it's okay. And I'm like, well, you don't have to do that. Well, I think you know what it is. I, yeah. when you've talked mainly to people who have not don't been through, that. you kind of that's how your, I think that that's how my mind is. Like, I'm so, I can tell the story, but I always have those little, oh, because you have, you, 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 you know that it's making, what's that? Are you protecting them? I am. Yeah. I am. I am. And I will say, I, it made, um, I had somebody say to me that, um, and this was somebody with the nonprofit, a, a donor. It wasn't somebody in the nonprofit. And they're like, you know, that was really hard. Like they were saying that, it, what did they say? It was, um, it was very uh, raw. That was a lot. That was a lot for me. That rawness was a lot for me. And so I'm so, when I've heard that, I started to go, oh, nobody you're understands. To, you're trying to protect people who can't handle reality. Correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, yes, because I have... Um, I used to do this speech that was, you know, I told people, yeah, my mom sold me for drugs. Yeah, my mom used to hit me. She used to tell me she hated me. She, But that selling for drugs, man, people would, you can see them. Like you can see the whatever. And it was like, I couldn't, like I could talk to you. I could say it and not a problem. But yes, I was so trained as, as I've gotten older and, and I think more so because now I'm starting to talk. And mm -hmm. so I haven't, um, had the, uh, um, ability to talk to a lot of people where they completely understand, you know, in, in the rawness there, there's a group, but you know, I've been speaking to a lot of people who are wanting to learn, maybe starting to go through the process of trying to heal. And you can tell when it starts to get them where they're like, they shut off. I have a friend who shuts off, like just shuts off 
So it's yeah. almost as if I'm trying to just take baby steps with her. But just baby you're, steps. You're the negotiator. Yeah. She's going to surrender. That's freeze. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean she's not listening or doesn't care. She's actually absorbing a lot of information and doesn't know what to do yet. Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. She's coming around. And she was, um, she's been my friend since I'm a year older than her. And her mother mm -hmm. and my mother were best friends. And, you know, oh, they shit. were. So I protected her a lot. Yeah, and do. so, um, and still do absolutely. And so she's heard some of my things and she's like, you know, I'm so proud of you. And if I say I'm proud of, like, I'm, I'm proud of you, you're doing a great job being a mom. She's like, that means so much to me. And I'm like, you're doing this. And she, you know, she has said you're, you're where I want to be someday. That's great. Let's get there. Right. So yes, yes, you're right. I mean, I think we do it. I think I do it naturally because this is just the way I've been. It's, your, it's I've part been. of the negotiator. It's still part yeah. of your coping mechanism is that well, you have yeah. to, you have to still protect and save everybody by all, like altering or sacrificing yourself for them to be okay. It's still the same system. Yeah. Yeah. I think you might be the first person that, <laughs> that I've talked to was like, I don't care. Just say it. Right. <laughs> just say it. Well, not a lot of people are trained to be able to handle somebody's unload, mm. you know, especially when it comes to being able to take on somebody's nightmare situations. But when I tell you this is my side gig, the the podcast that I do, this is just what I do when I'm not actually doing what I do. But I have people come and see what I do when I'm really working with people and I'll go right into hell. I'll yeah. come get you. And if you're like, I'm burning right now, I'm like, I know where you're at. I'm on yeah. my way. I don't read a book. I don't tell you from a credential point of view. I'm not giving you a map for I'm reading a GPS on the telephone. I'll be there in an hour. Have your shoes on. Yeah. We're walking out together. Somebody, I read something somewhere. If you want to know a survivor story, don't read it in a book. Go ask a survivor. Well, the, and... intro, the <clears throat> intro to this is that the... Uh, the answers that you're seeking are not found in books. They're found on the battlefield. Right. And if you're trying to find out who you really are, you're going to get it by going through the trials, not by reading about trials. Correct. Yeah. I thought, I think part of my, I thought to heal, you had to forgive because every book said that. Forgive and I'm going to, huh? Forgive who? Uh, oh, the abuser. Like uh, people would say to me all the time and you would read in there, you have to forgive who's abused you. No, I don't. And until mm. like I, for the longest time, I was like, mm, I can't heal. I just can't do it. I can't heal. I'll never heal because I will never forgive. And then um, I was like, you know what? No, fuck it. I do not need to heal. I mean, I do not need that in order to heal. I told somebody this. Somebody was talking to me and they're like, um, just recently too. And they're like, I, I just can't forgive. I'm like, who told you you had to? Well, mm -hmm. you know, you, you read these things. I said, stop reading. Um, and then I'm like, they said they watched somebody and they're like, oh, well, they said you really had to forgive. No, you don't. No, you don't. Like I am a firm believer. That is one thing. Do not ask me to forgive that. I do not forgive it. I won't let it control me. Like mm -hmm. when I said, here's the thing with healing. I said, I don't for, I don't need to forgive someone. I just learned to not allow it to control me, you know, and I'm still learning. I'm still that that's going to be a work in progress. I don't think I'm ever going to get to the holy shit. I did it. But I think want, that that's, that's the, the thing. Do you want the missing piece? Of course I do. It's not about forgiveness when it comes to some of these things. There's a degree of acceptance that you can get for what is, but you don't have to forgive. I also agree with you. The things that happened to you, they were monstrous, but it's not on you because of what happened, because you were just a little girl. You were a little kid. It was You were supposed to be protected, loved, and nurtured at this phase. That part, that stuff did happen to you. You were not in any position to do otherwise. Right. So there's a few things that you can have. Here's one thing that's really fucked up. And I, I apply this to my parents too. I did not come from a happy place. Yeah. So your parents, both of them, they mm. didn't wake up every day saying how they're going to be the worst and they're going to fuck their whole life up. They didn't wake up with a plan to destroy themselves. This wasn't a conscious or planned decision. Here's the most fucked up thing about your parents. That was them doing the best they knew. 
I, you know I, I, yeah. This is the, it's the answer. It's not the solution. Just so you know. No, I think I, I always, not you know, as I got older, because I refused to give them excuses for a long time, I do realize that, um, well, I realized that their lives were hard too. I do. I do. Because I heard some things, you know, as you grow up and you hear different things and you kind of really kind of, for me, I started to recognize things. Once I kind of removed myself from a lot, I started to recognize and I, I can see where things were. And absolutely. I mean, they, they, I broke a cycle and I always hate that word too. Oh, you broke the cycle. No, I just, I, I just, just not so going to do that. You destroyed but, a generational curse. Yeah. And so, um, but I also don't want to give um, them an excuse for that because, and the reason why well, I always say that is because, you know, if that were the case, I should be doing it to my kids too. Like, oh, I mean, cause I had a shitty, shitty childhood. Well, I got it, but I, there's some, in my belief, there's some room for, you have to kind of figure, no. I always say we all have choices, whether we want to see it or not. We do have choices. Now, some of us might be able to see them better than other people. For me, I feel like that that's, that's what it was. Like people say, oh, well, you know, God put the right people in your life at the right time. There's some truth in my belief that there is that. But even if it wasn't, there was something that I was able to, okay, break that cycle each of those times because what happened to me like statistically i should either be a drug addict an alcoholic a prostitute and i should be dead and at 14 yeah. i did try to take my life um that i attempted at 14 and two other times like contemplated it very heavily but at 14 i took uh, a bottle of pills crushed them up in water and i started to drink so um yeah i mean i know that there's I know that they had a lot going on. I wasn't so, finished because I'm not giving them an excuse. Oh, okay. Sorry. I can, I can tell you've had a lot of influences come at you from a lot of different ways. <laughs> okay, I'm not used so. to people being like, taught. I mean, I, I usually the talker to people. So this is kind of like, you know, <laughs> it's okay. I'm learning things. I'm going to take this. I'm going to run with it. No, that's good. <laughs> No, you're, you're you call okay. me on my bullshit, which is good. People need to call you on your bullshit, right? I mean, you should all, that, you should that's... challenge everything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. So the the part to say that they were doing their best. This is not to say they did good by any means. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not an excuse for them. It's an understanding and acceptance of them. That was them doing the best that they knew is not to say it's okay or right. you should forgive right. or that everything is fine now. It's fucking not. Mm. It is not okay. It's not forgivable. And I'm not going to, but I can accept it. That's their best, which means I'm not going to give any golden stars to people who are completely inept. Yeah. They do not have the skills. They had no business having a human. But the one thing that seems constant when it comes to babies like yourself when you were a kid is that there's no such thing as accidental babies. There mm. is definitely a such thing as accidental parents. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, they were not fit to be able to raise you. But here's also the part to it that's so fucked is... Let me give you some hope here. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> when it comes to the evolution that we have to go through for our belief systems, there's four major pieces that we have to go through in order to get to a higher level of ascension. And it's very, very difficult for each level. Okay. The first one you lived most of your life is that everything happened to me. You know, the victim mentality, you know, the, uh, this mm -hmm. is horrible, horrible. And how many people also, when they hear their story are still in that mode for themselves. Like, oh, that happened to you. That happened to you. And they call empathy, which it, listen, all your fucking bullshit friends, I'll call them out too. The ones <laughs> who say it's a lot for me to handle yeah. hearing what you went through yeah. and they call that empathy. No, it's not. No, it's not. They're caring about their feelings if they were you, not your feelings. Yeah. Just for anybody who calls that empathy, shove it up your ass. It's not. <laughs> That's not empathy. <laughs> I oh, if I... If I was in your shoes, I would feel terrible. Well, that's you, dickhead. Like, yep. I'm talking about what happened to me. Like, you, I was really there. <laughs> you're just, you're having an imaginary moment for what I actually went through. Yeah. And you're calling it connection. It's not. 
So anyways, it's just another way they make it about themselves. Sidetrack. Any yeah. case, you know, it. it happened to me. We yeah. also know the next step, and I'm sure this is where you've gone a lot of work in here, is how it happened for you. This mm-hmm. is where most coaches end up for a very long time. I know that it didn't happen just to me. There's a lesson and a mistake is, is meant to teach you something. And every loss is teaching me how to grow in some way, shape or form. So everything happened for me. It's the next phase. This is the growth phase. And people stay in here for a long time. How did that happen for me? How did that happen for me? How did that happen for me? At some point, though, if you're working through your your action side, what do I got to do? Make it happen. Work your way out. Kick ass. I've got this. That warrior side of you. Mm-hmm. At some point, you get that. The knowledge. How many people have you read and listened to and podcasts and read the books and, and gone to the seminars and did the speeches and did all the stuff? I'm doing all the things. Knowledge, 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 knowledge. Good for you. You know stuff now, right? <laughs> Yeah. And then you also go in, you got your, your spirit side on things. There's a faith. There's more to this than me. God had a plan or the universe is working through yeah. me or whatever. You call it whatever the fuck you want. There's something more than me. I'm not the center of the universe or else this universe sucks. And so it's not all me. There's something more going on than myself. Right. Yeah. You're with me so far. Right. Tap I it am in for with me. you. Once you start working through all the sides and you start getting the heart side involved, the spirit side, you start getting the body side and the mind side and you start working your ass off in every area and you go working for me, for me, for me, for me, you're going to hit a wall. There's a wall that you hit where it's no longer working for me. And you're like, what the fuck is this? (laughs) Yeah. The next phase gets into absolute acceptance. This is where you start seeing the people who are like, uh, running into the the Dalai Lama or you know Jesus or you know Gandhi, you start seeing these like these these figures who have found peace in Buddha or whatever mm-hmm. like transcendence. Yeah. I have acceptance of what is. You know, you're the, the how are you calm under fire? Because I'm not on fire. You know, it's like one of those things where what is happening is the next thing. So first, it's happening to you, then it's happening for you, and then it's going to get to it's happening or it happened, you Mm -hmm. know, and this sounds simple. It sounds like, oh yeah, okay, I get it, it happened. No, this isn't using denial as acceptance. This is not the same. This is truly at peace with what is. This is a huge jump, by the way, because you're gonna, you're a fucking warrior. I see you, you're you're a hustler. (laughs) You're gonna go forward, you're gonna charge, you're gonna go through the obstacles, you're gonna find a way around, over, over here, I go left, I go right, I go back, do I got backtrack, do I go a long way? You're going to make it happen. Right. And at some point you're gonna hit a thing where like everywhere you go is not working. Why can't I make it happen? There's a point where you get to where it's not left, right, up, down, dig a hole, jump over. It's none of those. It's sit down. B. You've been a human doing your whole life, Denise. Yeah. At some point, you'll get to time to be a human being. And it gets really, really weird because you've been grinding your whole life to be able to slow down. It's going to be like learning a new language. What do I do then? Yeah. Yeah. Now. This is where I see you also transcending into the the higher level of things is where you've come to acceptance of all things that are. You're no longer trying to control things, which, by the way, gives you a lot more control, which people don't know how to (laughs) comprehend until you get to a higher level. Actually letting go of control puts you in control. I agree. Yeah. What what the fuck, Rick? Like, yeah, you think that you are going to control how everybody sees you. You're going to control how everyone's allowed to feel. You're going to control their emotions for them and protect them from their own emotions. I'm going to control the way I tell the story so that they are okay through my reality. When you let go of the control and allow it to be, and they can go through all the things they need to go through. Don't call it relating. Mm -hmm. They can call it sympathy maybe because they're actually feeling sorry for themselves Yeah. But they don't understand, but maybe it gives them some perspective because the more raw the story, the more they can have gratitude if they have any awareness at all that I didn't have to go through what Denise went through, which also makes a lot of my excuses total fucking bullshit because if Denise can do it, well, my shit's not that bad. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. So there's that. The last one is going when things are, are going through you. They happen through you. This is your creator side. 
This is where like all of the things that have happened has made it so I can build something greater than myself, something that will transcend my existence and will ripple through time, something that will make it so the map that gets out of hell is somehow going to have a path that I carved that generation after generation after generation will be able to help somebody who's in dire fucking straits be able to have hope again. And they may not remember your name, but they'll still be using what you created. So all of the pain and trauma that you went through had a purpose and it's going to transcend anything that we'll ever be remembered for. That's, that's where, that's where I'm headed. That is where I'm headed. Act, it's interesting. You said, um, so I went on this trip and I'm around 150 people. This is the nonprofit trip that I went on, um, to, f- raise money for the shelter that I was in 150 riders there. And there are a number that I, I could definitely tell, like, I wanted them to like me. Right. And they were, um, one of my coaches who was, she saved my life when I was in high school. I literally was going to go take my life and something she said prior stopped me and I just didn't do it. She never knew I was about to do it. So there's my 32nd moment. She was on this trip and, you know, it's interesting when you get around certain people that you've been around when you were growing up in certain environments, you tend to go back to that. Like I would always go back to my 14 year old self. And instead of like approaching everything as 48, all of a sudden I get into that group with these people and here I am 14 again. And I've worked hard to kind of come out of that. And for the most part, I don't live around there. So it's been easier for me not to go back and revert. And I do, it's a conscious effort. Like, Okay. Like if I'm going to say you're 48, you're not, I could catch myself now. I've learned to do that. But I say this story is because when we were um, there, I can tell that there was a person in this group. There was three people and myself and this coach and uh, two other people. And I wanted this person to like me so much because she was a friend of my coaches and I wanted her to, you know, really like me. And it wasn't going that way. And typically some of the things that she came off as to me and like certain things that were happening. Like we went to dinner and you could tell she didn't want to sit near me. She pulled her chair. Now we're all grown adults. She's a lot older than me (laughs) and she pulled her chair away. And you know, typically that would have hurt me and I would have cried because I'm a people pleaser. I want people to like me. That's all I want is people like me. And for the first time, and I'm talking, this was just two months ago for the first time I sat there. I actually smiled the two times that something happened where it was blatant at me and I smiled and it was the first time. And, and that's where I think I'm in that process in that stage of heat of healing, of getting to my spot or whatever, because it was the first time I was like, you know what? That has nothing to do with me. That's a you problem, not a me problem. I don't, it's true. that's, that's all about you. And it's funny because it was almost, it gave me a power that I hadn't had before. The power to know that. Now, don't get me wrong. I I still have my overthinking moments where I'm like, what could I have done differently? Hindsight, because I'm here, I'm home, and I can think about that. But I don't stay there because I keep reminding myself, that's not a me problem. That's not my problem. That's her problem. I am authentic to me. She doesn't like me. She doesn't have to like me. I can't make her like me. And that's okay. And I had never done that before. And that kind of, for me personally... That kind of gave me a whole, um, that just made me more powerful than I'd ever felt before. And I know it's a simple thing, but it's those little things that I am learning as I get older and as I'm going through these different transitions with speaking, like I have learned so much about me, even though I've lived like, you know, I've lived this story, but speaking and being able to speak to others, I have learned so much about me that I've taken a power back that maybe had never been not even back I, t- I i held a power that i never felt i had before but i always have so interesting yeah there's a few things in there to un- unpack first off good on you i'm not gonna i'm not taking your victory that's for no sure. no <laughs> yeah please don't because i <laughs> i've been you, like you, super you freaking it. proud about that i'm like no, i keep doing job. that i'm like okay every time i go to try to people you know my, well, my instinct is to like how do i get this person to like me and it's, it's, that's my natural, like, I got to go to that. And since this happened two months ago, or a couple, yeah, about two months ago, I'm like, uh, I don't care. 
I like my little small. I don't care. They don't like. It doesn't matter. They don't matter to me. Denise, Denise. Yes, sir. Using, you're using your protection system. Oh but. damn it! See, I don't even know when I do that. <laughs> See, it's that's that that's so natural that I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, that's how you jump right into it. So, just so you know. Uh, one of the things to catch for the negotiator type is that they have to try to control the conversation by speaking a lot. And so this is one thing that you'll catch yourself like as soon as you feel like, oh, this could go wrong or this could go a different way, you'll start speaking very quickly to try to make sure it stays on a safer track. That's funny. I didn't. It's yeah. not a bad thing. It's it's a safety mechanism. So it's not a judgment. I'm not saying you did something wrong. I can just see. No, but I've never. It. I have I, to keep I, it safe. <laughs> yeah, now I'm going to go research negotiator. I, I, well, like, I'm, like, I'm, oh. ri I'm writing on it because you're going to find more stuff on fawning, but it's incomplete. It's okay, not well, done correctly. I can just talk to you about it. I <laughs> we'll like it. No, I like we'll it because, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, I said this to somebody recently. I said, I am, I'm learning and growing as a person, but I'm not where I want to be yet. Sure. Like I, I have come a long way. I am proud of myself. I am proud of all the things I did, but there is so much more for me to do. I have a really close teacher friend. There's a couple and she's always like, oh, I'm so proud of you. She came from a very horrible background. She's in her late seventies, um, but came from a really bad background. And she will always say to me, um, oh, you're so far ahead of where I was at your age. You're so far ahead at, of where you were at, at, you know, at my age. I'm like, yeah, but I'm still not where I want to be. I mean, that's great, but I'm not where I want to be. So I'm not yeah. done yet. I always tell her that. I'm oh, like, I'm no, not I, done I, yet. You're, you're not done yet. No, I <laughs> She's agree like, with oh, you. Oh, you're so good. I'm like, no, I'm not done yet. <laughs> uh, can I ask you a couple of questions about yeah. this thing? Um, you do, you're doing a very good job of having the correct answer, but I do want to get a couple of things underneath it. Um, this lady, when she was doing that, you were trying so hard for the external validation of somebody to like you. You know, and this is a natural piece for, for a lot of people, especially uh, when, when we talk with women, just so you know, like, uh, you ever see my video where I talk about the three basic needs for men? I don't know if I you've have, seen this I, one. Yeah. yeah. For guys, it's funny. You got, guys want this hungry, horny appreciation. We're simple. <laughs> yeah. We're monkeys. But just, yeah. just tell us we're awesome. Cheer us on and rub our bellies. We'll do whatever you want. We're very simple. It's nice. Now, huh? women's women's is not as glamorous. And I've seen a lot of ones that talk about women's shit. And I wish it was something fun like Prada, Gucci, Louis Vuitton. I wish it was something <laughs> great. It's not, though. The reality is, is you've you've had a lot of the basic needs for a woman has been messed up for you. Yeah. The first one is obviously the reassurance aspect. That's safety and security. Well, that was all goofed up for you. And you've had to try to negotiate to create safety security by controlling the people who are supposed to be your protectors, who were actually your persecutors. Mm. That, you know, runs along lines of Stockholm syndrome, but we'll do that in a different way. Um, the other part, though, is the second part for women is approval or acceptance. Mm. Now, I wish it was for men, but it's not. They want to be chosen by a good man, a high values man, not a value man, high values man. They want to be chosen. But beyond that, most of the approval system comes from other women. Mm. And so they want to fit in. They want to be a part of the group. They want to be liked. And that's yes. very important to a lot of women. They don't talk about that very much because that's not as glamorous. That's not very fun. Right. That's why women, though, when they bully, do, they do social and uh, reputation demolition. Mm -hmm. And they destroy each other's, you know, who they are so they don't fit in or they're not good enough. And that's why they do that is because acceptance is such a major part for women. You know, it takes a village, that whole thing. Yeah. Then the last part, and this is the part that's being manipulated pretty hard these days, is hypergamy. You know, you, know, you did dodge the bullet on this one because we, we, we aged a little bit out of this one because nowadays they've turned hypergamy into a weapon. But uh -huh. hypergamy just means how do you choose a partner? Like, well, how do you know what a good partner is? And this has been really, really messed up. But we'll get into that. That's a different conversation. I want to stay on the acceptance one. The second. <laughs> Thanks. Let's, let's get into the second one. You wanted to be, you wanted the validation. I want this person to like me. And you mm -hmm. created a, a thing inside of your head that I'm going to work so they like me. Mm -hmm. And even that by itself, it's hard to argue authenticity if I'm going to be doing something for approval. Right. 
So that by right. itself is like, oh, maybe we're not being authentic yet because yeah. I'm trying to be something. So I'm liked by someone else. Mm -hmm. Well, true authenticity does not require another person to like you because you just be you and it doesn't need anybody else to like it or not like it. It still yeah. is. Yeah. And I am right at that stage right now. That's where I'm at. Like that was my, I think that that's what kept me silent. That's what kept me not doing what I want to do because I was always worried about what would other people think and what mm -hmm. would other people say. Even and funnier, it's, something it's that not I, what other people, it's not what other people think. It's what you would make up other people think. Yes, that's, <laughs> yes, no, that's true because it, that's, that's exactly true. I make the stories up in my head so that mm -hmm. I can, you know, you, I walk into a room and I, I, you know, scan the room. I'm prepared. Like, you know, I want to always be prepared, but yes, that's exactly that. Like I have learned that it's what I'm telling myself. What am I, what am I telling myself that they're thinking? It's still in my mind. I still always think, oh, what are they thinking? What are they saying? Because I'm, I'm, that's just kind of my nature of, of what, of how I think, but sure. I am, I'm currently at this stage where it is, I'm learning to, I don't want to say not care because that's not true because I do care. But at the same, but, I care more about me now. I'm going yeah. from caring about what I think they want to, you're right, the authenticity of who I am. That's been a struggle. That really, yeah. really has. And um, part, again, of deciding I'm going to start speaking and doing more speaking and, and things like that. I, as I mentioned before, it's a lot of the times it's talking to teachers just to tell them that they're, that they're so valuable, that they're, they're more valuable because, you know, I needed them in my fantasy to survive. You know what I mean? But it was, um, I finally at this space where I am learning for myself to not give a shit. I yeah. I don't know if that's the right way or, or kosher is, or whatever, but I am, I am at the point where it's like, I don't give a shit. It, it doesn't make like, doesn't make me happy. Like when I'm walking in the mornings and I am like going through my, my motivational things and I'm, I'm walking because to be honest with you, that for me, that has been such a great thing because it's my world inside my head. And I always hate when people say that too, because when I say that, sometimes I get really defensive in that manner where, because I was always trained as a kid that I made up the abuse. I made up this stuff. So you always are very, um, I, I do, I'm very tiptoeing around that because I don't want somebody to say, oh, well, you're making it up just like you made up the excuse. But I, um, I, <laughs> I utilize some of these things. These are my coping. This is what helps me to, to navigate. But an example is this, when I start to fear that failure, even though failure is just a part of life and I'm like, okay, well, what am I learning? Like I know consciously, okay, I'm going to learn something from them. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go. Um, I have now, like I can hear in my head, I know it sounds weird, but it is what it is, but I can hear in my head, uh, Denzel Washington gave this, um, this commencement speech and he said, when you fail, fail, uh, when you fall, fall forward. And for me personally, anytime I get into a situation now where I start to like start to back up and get my, def my defensiveness or, or that I don't pursue something I want to pursue because I'm afraid of the failure. I'm afraid of people not liking me. I'm afraid of all this other stuff. I literally have learned. And I'm, and I say like recently, like Every time I get that fear, I almost stop my, well, I do. I stop myself and I'm like, no, fall, fall forward though. If you're going to fall, cause you're going to fall, fall forward. Don't be afraid to fall. And these are just some of the things that, that I'm now getting through and learning how to, um, get to that point where I'm taking away the people pleasing, even though it's difficult. And I am, you know, I am not, I am still, <laughs> I am still wanting people, but being able to talk and, and openly talk more and more. My husband didn't know a lot of these stories and he is one where he will say, um, you know, I'm proud of you. I know what you're, you know, that you're saying everything, but as your husband, it's so difficult for me to, um, to hear what's happened to you. And I've respected mm -hmm. that he knows a little bit. I mean, he, he has gotten it. He read, um, I, my, 
Reader's Digest of my story was published in a tabletop book full of kids who and adults who have been um, in the system in kinship care and because I was in kinship there um, in foster care, whatever it was, it was um, Malatac was um, the writer, the publisher behind it. Um, they did a whole series of removed and, and different um, videos. He was a filmmaker. Anyway, my husband wrote, read that and that was back in 2018 and it was difficult for him, but he did. And now it's where I was not saying a lot of things because I didn't want to hurt him. And you were saying about this earlier. It was hard because I didn't want him to hurt. But now he has said to me, he's like, I am proud that you're doing what you're doing. You know, understand that it's not that I don't want to hear you because I do, but it hurts. So I'm proud of you. I am here. I am supporting you, whatever you need from me. Um, but I'm not going to sit next to you while you're telling your <laughs> story to someone. And I respect that. I actually am okay with that because it's, it's, you what know. What do you think his reason is? What do you think it is? What's that? What do you think his reason is for that? <sighs> you you I, make up people's thoughts. What did you make up for him? Well, I mean, I don't know if I made it up or we really had this discussion where it's, you know, <laughs> the, the viciousness of things that happened to me. He can't imagine somebody hurting me like that. And then he looks at our daughter and we've talked about this too. I have a son who has special needs and we cannot imagine somebody, he cannot, I mean, obviously I lived through it. Yes, I can. But he looks at, at me as, as much as he loves me and cannot imagine somebody having to have had people do those things to me. And he has known them, like he knew them before. He just, we, we haven't had yeah. contact with the family since 2014, but I had to have a court order done three years ago because she tried coming around here. And I can get into that later too, but- We don't have that. That one we don't have to. Okay. So we, um, so- it's, it's that he, you know, before I wouldn't share my story because I was really afraid of him hearing. And it got to the point where we were talking about authenticity. And it, I wasn't being authentic because I wasn't being able to be me because I was hiding behind what I thought other people needed from me instead of me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so this, this really, and this like with, within the last couple months, and I said, you know what, I really want to do this. And he was like, okay, I want you to do what you want to do. I want you to do this for you. I mean, for him, you know, but he was like, you need to do this. And so it's the first time where I don't know that I needed his approval, which I didn't, because he always says to me, you do not need to ask for my approval to do anything that, that you want to do, which is great. But you know me, with the background that I had, I felt like I needed that. But after you know, I, I don't know, all of a sudden, it just whether I needed his approval, or not, I didn't, but it was really nice to know that he was on board and saying, you know what, Denise, whatever makes you happy, I am 100% behind that itself kind of opened me up to starting to find myself starting to find my voice that has been inside. And like you said, I come defensive and I probably got to do that for the rest of the speech. <laughs> I'm going to learn, I'm going to get there, which is really good because I like, you know, I've learned that if people don't call me on my bullshit or stop me and show me something, I'll never learn. I'll think I'm where I'm supposed to be. I don't read books because well, I'm dyslexic and I just cannot get into a book. Um, so for me, having somebody say, Hey, guess what? This is what I see. This is what I see as hard, as hard as it is sometimes that you have to hear it. It's good. It's good. But this is my, this is where I want to be. This is where I am going. This is where I am happiest knowing that somebody can take from my shittiness and see something good for themselves. Does that make you sense? Threw, like you threw some stank on that one. Yeah. The way you said the way you said shittiness on that one, there was something <laughs> else on there too. I th there's some stuff you're sorting out for sure. Um, yeah. Here's the simple answer for your husband. That's your protector. No, oh, yeah. You're trying to protect him, but he can't hear you get hurt because he yeah. wants to save you. Oh, true. Very that's true. What wow. men, that's what that's what us good men do. Yeah. I don't want to think about my girl getting hurt because I want to save you. Yeah. Yeah, he, um, he definitely is. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. It's a, little the more, it's a little simpler. It's a simpler answer. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you just have a 30 minute answer for him. It's just he's your protector. But <laughs> it's good. Yeah, he is. He is. No, he's good. I have good. a question for you. Have Have you done anything to um, know your personality type yet? Have you? I'm just curious. I, I have a hypothesis on this one. You know, people have always made their speculations, but to be honest with you, no. Okay. I have, have, some, I've... have some fun outside of here. Just uh, do a free Enneagram test. Um, and just, I, I think you're a type two. <laughs> I was going to say the number because somebody else, I'm like, is that the number thing? Because somebody it's might have said one. something about two. It's a helper. It's the helper type. Yeah. It's the person who, um, they're on the heart side. You have a big heart. Yeah. And you're on the heart side. And you, they, they seek external validation. But also another thing with type two is that people oftentimes really struggle with is that they sort by talking it out that's pretty much me yeah which yeah. a lot of times the more that you talk you'll end up finding your answer you're seeking but you have to talk it out to get there and yeah. there's a lot of people um who don't understand that and so you'll see people get judgmental, which then you try to curb the way that you're sorting because you don't want them to feel bad. So you change the way that you process, which slows down your processing because they can't deal with it. And so then you're a little bit more stuck, but you still need to get it out. But you don't have anybody who can really listen. But then they start creating their own thing and probably turn it into their thing. And then you have to listen to their <laughs> stuff and then you stop working on your stuff. It's tough. It's, it's, it's a rough system. Yeah. And there's a very few people who can go through where you're going, at least keep you going on one track because it's tough because twos will stack. And well, a lot of people stack, they'll stack. Mm. Like even what you just did, you did a monologue with six different things. <laughs> yeah. I, like and the so ADHD, like, I have 12 tabs open with one computer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which which is fine. There's not, it's not wrong with that. It's just sometimes it's tough for people to be able to stay with you because you're connected to an emotion. And you're like, this feeling is connected to this thing, this thing, and this thing. And people who don't understand that will get lost. Yes. You know, but it's not that you're trying to lose them. It's just how you sort. Yes. My, my best you know, friend will say anytime I'm talking and I could be talking about anything, but we talk about this too. She'll, she'll go focus. Like that's her cue to me. Focus. But that's her trying to control your. Well, yes, but you, right, right, right. Oh well, no, you're right. Yeah, you are. You're doing a sort the way that you sort. Yes. It's not wrong. It's your way. It's just other people don't have that way. And so they'll say, you need to focus when you're like, no, I'm doing it. Yeah. 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 This no, is the true. part for when, when you start getting an authenticity, it's not that anything is right or wrong. It's just is, but some people have a judgment about what it should be, which makes you feel like you're doing something wrong when it's your way. Right. And this is where like sometimes the, the let me ask you a question too and this would probably it's probably already a rhetorical question have you struggled through your life and you're working really really hard to get better at it with healthy boundaries oh yeah for sure for yeah. sure yeah classic yeah <laughs> like the yeah. <laughs> all, all my helper types those big-hearted helpers they will do anything for anybody even at the cost of themselves and it's been like that since you were very 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 little yeah and so you've been sacrificing who you are to make other people feel happy for so long holding a healthy boundary seems like you're going to be throwing love in the garbage Mm -hmm. And you know what? Um, something did happen about 2018. And, uh, you know, I was trying to help other people and not protect myself. And I got, man, yeah. And you know what I learned from that? Because again, I do learn. Um, and, and somebody, a good friend said this, you know, when you can remove yourself from it and you can look from the outside, you can start realizing what it was. So, so when I removed myself from it, I realized, oh my God, I was like in this thing that I should never have been in, but I was trying to help somebody. And that was my always thing. I would say, well, she needs somebody to help her and she needs to no. know. And it wasn't until I removed myself that I saw that. And I, as shitty as it was, as shitty as it was, cause I was really bad. It, it, it killed me. Um, as shitty as it was, it was probably one of the best things that 
happened because that gave me the ability to see that, yeah, I, I really have sacrificed a lot for other people. And it, at that cost came to me. So I have learned over those couple years to keep my circle small with the people that make me feel good and sure. that I'm good with. So I don't have to, you know, there's no expectations from the friends in my group right now. Well, there are. There's still expectations well, for loyalty not, and betrayal. Yeah, and but I mean, not not as. Husband. There's right, still there's right, still rules. But, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. But I mean, there's no like that that other friend group was like you know you have to drop everything and be here for. And I'm in my 40s and this happened. So I mean, it, there's it, there's it, some it to say when matter. you're. <laughs> but, you're you're accustomed to abuse and it looks yeah. like normal. Right. And so I, like, again, I mean, as shitty as it was, I think I'm thankful that it happened because it really taught me a lot about me. And I have yeah. learned, I still have probably a long way to go with boundaries, but I'm working on them. I recognize more now than I had ever. I don't, well, prior to that, I never really recognized. If somebody said, oh, your boundaries, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Do you know what it means? I'm, I'm not, I'm not messing with you. Do you know what a boundary means? And this isn't me being shitty. I'm really well, in, no, in my, my opinion is where are you going to affect me? Like for, for me, for boundaries, when I think of boundaries is, are you, um, are you crossing into my comfort zone? Are you making me, that's my, my boundaries. I, I mean, I'm sure. And there's possibly no, no, go, other go, people with think you don't, you don't have to protect me. I'm okay. Okay. No, I mean, well, no, not to protect you. I am sure that with each of us, we may see boundaries as different. I, want I know, have though. learned that yeah, my boundary. Know, like, what, is, what is a boundary? Like, like, give me an example. Um, well, I mean, if I give you an example from that other time for me, it sure. was for what? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah go ahead. Okay. Go for it. For, from that friend situation, it was like, uh, you know, it was, I need somebody to come here now. I need somebody to come here now. And knowing that I really didn't have the time, knowing that that's too much for me because I have my own shit going on. I have a child with autism. I have a child who's going through medical, but I have to be there, you know, and I didn't know that she was encroaching on my area of me being who I needed to be and what my family needed to be. And just for me, because at my peace, I was, <laughs> I, it was crossing into my peace. And so for me, that was a boundary issue. I didn't have the ability to say to her, I'm sorry, I don't have time. This is more important. I didn't have the ability to say to her, that's you. I, I that's not my problem. You have to figure that out yourself. Even though I, I don't know if that's a boundary thing, but it was for me. It's uh, I think that that, that was something that I had to learn because I would drop everything for somebody else. And then I never allowed that. No, like I didn't know how to yeah. say no. I know. <laughs> I know. I, yeah. I am aware. <laughs> I know your personality. But you hear me. <laughs> I hear you. No. And the priorities are very difficult because you don't rank very high in the priority system mm -hmm. when it comes to other people, because if you do it, it most likely most common term I've heard with people who do this negotiation system is that me taking care of me is selfish. Yes. Yeah, yes. it's the most common thing that I hear, in which case you having a priority where you have to put you ahead of somebody else's needs feels like you're counteracting approval and love. Right. Well, right. And, and that's so that system is backwards. I'm going to stay yeah. with boundaries for a second. Well, no, I mean, now, that that's really interesting because I in this process of learning boundaries, like I said something to myself probably like the last couple of days, it kind of clicked with me and then the boundaries of what you're saying is, you know, I love my kids and I need to be there for them. And obviously with special needs is a whole other area. But sure. if I'm not taking care of me, there is no way I'm taking care of them. So for me, I did start to put myself before everybody else. And I learned that I'm not being selfish by doing that. And it was something that for me, when Correct. I say that, when I say I'm not being selfish is because when I could do like this whole thing, no, I'm doing it for me, but really like, if I don't do it for me, I'm not going to be good enough. I'm not good for you. Let me rephrase that into where I can, want to. Can, it's my mind not you? saying anything. Is yeah. it okay if I help you? You may. If I take care of myself, it makes me so much better to take care of others. Thank you. Well, yeah. yes, yes. Others. I think of my kids. That's what I think. That of. They uh, yeah. count as others. They uh, are yes. also 
a different thing than yes. you. Yes. <laughs> they are others. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but if you charge your battery, then you have more battery to give. But right. if you don't charge your battery and you start off the day at 20%, even if you give them all 20%, you're still gassed because you started off with a low battery. But if yes. you take care of you first and you charge your battery for yourself, you're filled. Now I have more to give throughout the day. People yeah. do not understand that at first because they call it selfish to charge your own battery. Yeah. But you become the best mom, best wife, best friend, best speaker when you take care of you first. Yes. And I'm going, I am learning that I'm not where I need to be yet, but I am definitely learning that, Smart. especially with my kids, my, my daughter's 19, she'll be 20. And my son who has autism and other medical needs, he'll, he's seven, he'll be 18 next month. And, um, yeah, I mean, he's going to be living with us, you know, for the rest of our lives. And I need to be recharged. I need to be up to speed. I mean, he's easygoing. Well, it's not he's, like he's I, old you enough know. now that you can still go like, huh, I got to take care of me for a little bit. Well, You're and okay. I think that that's the thing. I think that's key, too. I think that helped and played a role into what I'm doing now. I'm doing mm -hmm. something for me now. Not that I shouldn't have been able to do that before, but that mentality of, you know, the sacrifice, you know, the sacrificing you for the other person. Yes. But I think I'm at that point now where, well, I know I'm at that point now where I need You're something for me. I'm not You're just the mom. Again. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Let's help you out a little bit. Boundaries are not demands. This is where people make mistakes all the time. You can't talk to me that way. You're not going to do this to me. You don't do that. Don't do this. Don't be that way. Don't do this stuff. Those are demands. That's not a boundary. That's telling people how they're supposed to be, you know, so that's not the same. A boundary right. like uh, versus a demand. Here's an example. Uh, that girl, that lady wanted you to come like, hey, you have to be here. Do this. Come do this. Come do that. Uh, demand is don't tell me what I'm supposed to do. I'm not going to do whatever you tell me to. No. Like that's you making a don't tell me what to do. Yeah. That, that's demands. A boundary is I hear what you're saying, but I'm not free until Monday. So I can come over Monday. That's mm. my next available time. Right. You can say whatever you want, but I still don't have the time open until then. No, oh, okay. Well, the, the, that's the, a boundary. Yeah. The yeah. difference between a demand and a boundary is a boundary is not what others need to do. A boundary is what happens, how I handle it. So Got if somebody, if, if this conversation were being hostile, for example, you can say a boundary, if I was being mean to you, example, you can say, Rick, like, if you keep talking to me this way, I'm going to have to hang up. This gives right. me now the option where I can continue being a jerk. And then you go, well, then the consequence <laughs> that you want me to do is hang up on you. So now I'll hang up on you. Right. Because that's where I draw the line on this conversation. You know, but then, you know, it's not an ultimatum. It's just here is my line. And if you cross it, there's a thing that I do for myself. Right, right. This gets oh, tricky wow. because it's not selfish. It's just this is where I hold my standards for respect for myself. This is where your self-worth has to be challenged by yourself so you know your own lines. Because how do you protect values if you don't know what your values are? I, oh, my God. I tell my... <sighs> I tell my daughter all the time, know your value. Anytime like me, I'm like, know what your value she's is. 19. I know she know. doesn't. And I'm like, but I, it's something that I want to instill in her that at some point in her life, we, we she knows she'll our hear it. Off. What? <laughs> we, will, we will try our asses off. I <laughs> right, have three right, right. teenagers, teenage oh. girls. We are trying to say the more you respect yourself, the more boys will respect you. Yeah, the yeah. The boys who don't are not the ones who will be worth putting your time into. They don't understand yet. Yeah, They yeah. have to touch the stove. And so it's, <laughs> let me just tell you how much they enjoy having a human behavior expert as a stepfather. Oh. I am the dumbest asshole they've ever met, even though I have a 100% success rate on calling what's going to happen. That's it's, like I'm the, it's like I'm the... The worst fortune tower they know. I'm like, told ya. They're like, I hate this. This is stupid. Well, it's funny because my daughter was dating this one guy. She didn't start dating until she was older because she was like me. I, it used to scare me that she was like me because I thought something was wrong. And that's why she was being reserved. Um, interesting, but, that's an interesting thing to say. Yeah. Well, Be, so. Being like you means something is wrong. 
Well, yes. In my, in, in my, so let me say how, why I say that. Let me explain myself to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I feel, no, I mean, but there's a real reason behind that. I, as, as somebody who's gone through the trauma of sexual abuse, you wonder, yeah. you know, when I know why I didn't like go yeah. out and seek, you know, having sex with people, dating people, because I was still, you know, traumatized. I mean, that, that lasted my whole life. But as a teenager, I was terrified of all these things. I saw her having the same behaviors and I was trying to dissect it of like, what the hell? Like we, we have a loving home. We have a love. I mean, I just couldn't understand it. So anyway, she, <laughs> she dated a guy that I was not a fan of and it was the first guy and you know, and I'm like, you know, know your worth, know you're this, know you're that. And, um, I scared them because she's my daughter. They have to fear me more than my husband because of my shit that I went through. I will, <laughs> I will go to war with anybody to protect my kid. Um, is your husband not that guy? Oh, he is, but I'm vicious. You're I'm loud. Loud. I will. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I am. Listen, yeah. there's no, no denying you're not fucking tough. I'm not oh, taking that I, away. You're tough as nails. There's no yeah. question. You're very, <laughs> very tough. I'll give you that. Yeah. No, but if my husband, oh, a yeah. grown man, yeah. you're not going to do as well. Well, yeah. I don't know about that. It's I've not, got a track not, record, but um, yeah, no, it's, listen, it's not to your advantage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I know it isn't. It isn't. But the guy that she's dating now, I actually really like him. I Good. say to him, are you sure you know what you're getting into? And he always says, yes, ma'am, I do. And I'm like, all right, because, you know, but I, I, yeah. So um, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not denying your warrior spirit. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking, not, yeah, not that's taking one. it away from you. Yeah, not no. for one. No, I just say as far as some of these, it's just know your battles on some yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah. You know, but there are yeah. there's a lot of bad boys out there. You got to remember too, young guys are in a totally different game, um, especially with the access to information now. Like, oh, our girls have got to go out with these kids who are literally just porn junkies. Like, like they think that that's what it's supposed to be. And it's like, hold on a second. Like, this is where I'm with you with know your value because yeah. you don't have to be a porn star because this jackass can't put his phone down. Like, this yeah. isn't how that works. Well, it's funny because you said that about my husband and my husband will always say to her, I was his age. Don't you forget mm -hmm. that? Like, I know, I know way I, I was his age. I know, I know what they want. I know. <laughs> and I'm like, well, really? That's, that's what they, well, I just, I just read the yeah. studies. <laughs> and so, <laughs> If you look at it, especially for this is where it's tough for girls and boys. It's not an easy. We're we're tough guinea pigs on this. You had we had tough shit we had to go through, but we also didn't have to compare ourselves to the globe. And so that's a different thing, too. But like uh, when they look at what's going on with social media, which we didn't even have that. Like, no, that, we were we were in our 20s before that even started. And so yeah. like that's not even a thing. Like yeah. for them, they was born into it. And so their entire identity is around social media, like Snapchat, which we had yeah. our kids get rid of and all yeah. these things. Well, it's tough because when you look at what's happening with boys, um, what's going on is there's like this tick and this is, I mean, this is Dr. Hayes stuff. Or, uh, and so if you look at his stuff, he was looking at the uptick for what's going on with boys and self-harm and issues. It was up like two or 3%. It's been going up, but it's really little bit. Mostly what boys use their phone for is like playing games, uh, like sports and talking to their buddies and porn. It's yeah. mostly a mobile porn hub. That's mostly what their phones are. And so that's teenage boys. Just there's, there's something bouncing on that phone at some point in time during any time. So that's just what it is. But there's yeah. a lot less um, social damage is being done. Now with girls, the social damage look like a bike ramp. It shoots all the way up now to the point where self-harm, uh, criticism, self-criticism, comparison curses, like these things are coming up because now they're comparing themselves on a global scale. Like, oh, and yeah. so it's no longer just your school or your community or, you know, something like that, who you, how do you measure up? It's the world. I am and so glad that, that, yeah, I'm so glad that we didn't have that because I have, you know, I had that too. And, and still do every time I go back or I get on social media, I'd take breaks from like Facebook and seeing people from my school age. Cause I always say like, man, I was in survival mode. I wasn't even able to, but I always, you know, you felt compared, you felt whatever, you felt whatever. Yeah. And 
Yeah, I, I'm so our, our girls today multiply that by a billion. Mm, mm -hmm. That's what they have today. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that that didn't happen to me. So we no shit. This is where like <laughs> we're, we're the guinea pig parents. They're actually when they look back in history, they're going to watch what did we do? And if you watch things like the social dilemma and things like this, people who created these like Pinterest or whatever. Yeah. Like the people who created them, like no, we had to we had to stop because the algorithms are designed to outsmart us, and they do. Mm -hmm. Like and so our kids are born in a world where they are being controlled by an algorithm that's been created to do so, and we as parents have no fucking clue what we're doing with this because we're the first ones to I... even have this be a thing. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, I had no clue how to be a parent in the first place. This is just added to my, uh, you know. <laughs> Let's throw a global comparison <laughs> onto my children. Shit. Yeah. yeah, that's that's all I need. There you go. That's yeah, it. Yeah, fun game that we're in. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's tough when you have to try and break curses that never existed before. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, great. yeah. <laughs> so props to you. But yeah, Thanks. it's tough with, with our kids going out there and doing this thing, and, and it's tough to our middle one. She just had a her first love who was young me and so i'm like i'll give you the play-by-play -play on this dickhead <laughs> like, i'll tell you what he's gonna do and honest i'll just put it on there i, I was right a hundred percent of the time i'm like within the next two months expect this yeah it looks like this is coming up and they would be like we don't want to hear it and she started crying like i don't want to talk about it and i'm like yeah all right well she's also the seven personality type she's uh the enthusiast she does not like bad news uh, and so only good news, please. Those are the tiggers of the oh, Enneagram. Well, that's I... just bounce instead. Bounce, bounce. Like they don't want to talk about bad stuff. Yeah. And so when it came to that, um, you probably have friends like that. Your shutdown friend may even be like that. Well, I don't want to hear bad things. Yeah. Oh, yes. When yes. It, yep. When those people, when they hear bad news, they go right into a denial system. Complete denial. Shut it down. Not real. Nope. 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 Don't want don't to talk about that. Yeah. And when those come up, um, I would try and warn her ahead of time, like, this is going to happen. And then exactly everything that I said is going to happen. It's like I was fortune telling. I'm like, there it is. And they're like, oh, my God, this happened. And I'm like, uh, oh, am I sh I'm shocked. Oh, <laughs> what? I, I didn't know. You didn't know you were supposed to play that, right? I'm like, I called it two months ago. You guys didn't want to talk to me. Remember? Yep. I'm like, don't be surprised if he does this next. Oh, don't say that. That's not nice. I'm like, oh, okay. And then the yeah. next time we see the kid, he's doing exactly what I said. I'm like, oh, are we surprised again? What? Oh. Yeah. That's funny. Like, yeah, that's that goes yeah, along I'm, with us. I'm an kids. interesting one to have around. I'm like, well, that's happening. <laughs> I bet. I bet they love it. <laughs> they hate it. They hate it so much. <laughs> And so when they're older, they're going to be like, Rick, vet this one. What do you think? And I'm like, oh, it looks like he does this, this, and this. Just heads up with this thing, challenge this thing, and see if that thing works that way. If he comes yeah. out authentic, it'd be a good one. If he yeah. gives you some bullshit run around, get out of there. My, like, uh, and be like, okay. my daughter is so funny because that first boyfriend, that's exactly what she kept saying to me. What do you get? What do you feel? What do you think? What that's do you think? Girl. I said, I'm still, yeah. I'm still processing them. I, I don't know right now because I was still, I knew what I felt. That's I just true. wanted to give it a second or two because it was her first, you know, you let me, you get, you put some of whatever your daughter's doing in some of mine. Cause I would like that. Like, what do you see? I'd like yeah, that. Yeah. That she does though. I mean, like I am fortunate about that. Cause a lot of people, I know that. And she'll go, what do you think? Just tell me, just tell me, <laughs> but I tell her and kind of like you, no, you know, but then she, at the end, she was like, you were right. And I'm like, why would you ask me in the beginning what I think if you knew I was going to be right? Well, no, that's why. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is when it comes down to odds are if I, uh, because you are a people reader, you can mm -hmm. probably reach it very, very, very fast. The only downside to your people reader is that you add in their thoughts. Yes. And that's that's the only inaccurate part is because you can read micro expressions and you can read uh, intent. You can read energy. I'm sure you can read that very, very, very fast. Yeah. Um, the only thing is, is you add in your experiences and your thoughts to them. And that's where it goes off the rails because it goes from uh, intuition to assumption and assumptions are not facts. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I've been I I've definitely have done that since I was little. Like I said, my earliest memories are four and I do, I, I, I can tell you like, 
I knew. I just knew, you know. But yeah, I I think as I grew older, is the assumptions came out because you didn't yeah. understand that so much when you were little. It was more of definitely knew we, when it was not good. Well, we're gonna have a talk outside of this. I'll break down what the negotiator is for you. Yeah, you're gonna and have to because you're gonna go fucking fuck. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, but, it, but it but it gives you hope because there's also a very healthy version to do it all of our coping mechanisms are not dangerous or bad it's just there's a healthy version and an unhealthy version yeah. but you never you're never shown a healthy version there yeah. is a healthy way to do this it is very useful a good mediator a good person mm -hmm. to be able to try and assess different points of view a, a person who can find relatability and understanding and a conversation very very healthy things to be able to do a good balancer you know the only thing is is the unhealthy version will self-sacrifice for others emotions they take on other people's pain as their own like there's an unhealthy version of this too the people pleasing and an over giving to where you lose yourself for them to be okay mm -hmm. like that's the unhealthy version the healthy version you stay and remain intact as you but you are able to find a, a common ground for people to relate it's very useful yeah that's and, uh, well so, yeah the common yeah. ground is probably where, you know, with the whole speaking is something I need to learn because I'm either here or I'm here. And so I would like that because I want to go to this side, <laughs> but I also want to be able to be there for these people over there. So it's, it's, right. yeah. I would, I would work with you on your acceptance. This is the mastery that I would put in your toolbox is, That's well, nice. where they are is just where they are. Yeah. And you are not in control of where they are or how they handle it or how they take it. They are just where they are and they're going to have to process that on their own journey. And that's right. okay. Right. No, that's true. I, I have all these things to, yeah, There's all these interesting things today. Yeah. You're close though. The I don't give a shit and fuck it thing. <laughs> it's, the, it's the path to acceptance. I, it's, that... it's the right path. It's needed. It's a, it's a part of it. I will tell you that is the most freeing thing to have had I, I i it's so and you know, obviously know but it's so indescribable how i feel finally being there like yeah. i can't believe it took me this long but i i, I, I needed it took, yeah. you know it was probably the right place on my journey as i'm going but man do i god it's just a freaking good feeling to be there yeah. You know, you're, you're taking your power back and also uh, you're finding your courage. Yeah. Your courage. Here's something to remember. Fear hates courage. It has to take it away from you because it's the thing that beats it. Yeah. Courage is a thing where you look at something that's bigger, scarier. That's not, this is not going to be fun. This is potentially going to hurt and go, well, doing it anyway. Yeah. Like. The only the only difficult part with that definition is it's also the same definition for stupidity. And that's what makes it hard. <laughs> it's yeah. just, this may hurt, but I'm going to do it anyways. It's a slight difference between hold my beer and hold my Red Bull. Very, <laughs> very different. Yeah. And so <laughs> it looks the same until you see the outcome. <laughs> but, yeah, that's a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the courage is definitely, I'm, I'm, I'm there. The more, the more, like I said in the beginning, the more I've shared my story, the more courageous I have become. Yeah. No, you so. are, you are definitely a warrior. I would, uh, my advice, heart to heart, brother to sister on this one would be keep working towards acceptance. It's not yeah. fuck it. It's not, I don't give a shit. It's not, you know, forgiveness. It's not grace. It's acceptance. And this is the next phase where you're at, where you can go, I can see that that's happening. And it's happening. That's what that is. Okay. I'm yeah. not mad. I'm not sad. I'm not bargaining. I'm not denying. I'm like, that's where you are. Okay. There's a Robert Downey Jr. quote that you'll enjoy. People are going to give you blame, shame, and judgment your whole life. That's what people do, you know, and there's a, there's a, well, this is a combo quote for you. Uh, Carl Young, one of the quotes that I like from him is that, um, thinking is hard and that's why people judge instead. Mm, that's a, that it's is... a good one there. I would actually add in a piece to it. I would say thinking and empathy are hard and that's why people judge instead. People can't really do it. Yeah. So those okay. ones are, are complicated. Now the Robert Downey Jr. quote that you're going to like for the phase that you're at right now is people are going to be doing these things 
So oftentimes I'll listen, I'll smile and I'll agree with them. And then I'll go do whatever the fuck I was going to do anyways. <laughs> I do like that one. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 So like, yeah, yeah. Of course. Thank you. Well, that, thank you for sharing your opinion. Oh, that's a great idea. Of course. Thank you. Yes. I'm never doing that shit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing my own things though, but thank you for sharing. This is a, uh, this is a beauty of you being able to take your power back. Uh, the other thing that I would give you is you have a 14 year old's armor still, and I would upgrade oh, yeah. your armor for you. I would make yeah. it so you no longer have that system that kicks on as your default. And yeah. I would upgrade your default program to be far more advanced. So that way you can handle tougher situations without going into that, um, 14 year old shutdown mode thing that you do like you don't know oh, it's it's bad you know how uh somebody called me out on it it was one of my teachers she said you know you went from this conversation that we're having and you brought up this person and all of a sudden you're talking because i remember you when you were 14 all of a sudden i hear you like you're talking as if you are 14. man that was the most powerful thing i had ever heard and it it made me very, very aware of what I was doing. And that's, that's the work I've been doing for four years. I've yeah, been working yeah. on that. And I, I and I'm more recog I recognize it. Although I will tell you this real quick. She hmm. came on this trip with me, that teacher. Um, she came on the trip with me and she was my roommate. Cause I have a really hard time staying in uh, hotels and, and with people, of course, if I didn't know them. And um, she even like saw that I was going back and reverting into things. She's like, you're actually scaring me. I'm like, please don't tell me that. <laughs> I've worked too damn hard to not, but it was, it was very enlightening to have the same person who saw me say things at, you know, as my adult age, she's like, you're talking like you're 14 to actually say, I'm watching you now do that as well. And I had thought I'd overcome some of that, but I was never put in that situation again. You know, once you get back in, you know, it's easy to um, to go and, and progress and learn and, and do the, the hard work I'm doing, but it, you don't really know if it's working if you're not back in the same situation that causes you to revert back. For instance, yeah. if I go back to New Jersey, which is where I'm from, I'm on the board for the, the um, shelter, but I also get up there and that shelter, which I love and, and, you know, that's my passion there. I know that I have to remind myself, you know, I'm not that kid in there anymore. And I don't You're have to like gain. Warrior, yeah. Know. I don't have to gain the, the, you know, I have people who love me. It's not like I'm, you know, but it, it's interesting, but that's probably where, as I grow, I want to see that as I grow, that's my, um, that's what I know that I'm on the right track when I don't allow myself to, to jump back in. Cause it's easy. Like I'm, I'm in Virginia and when I'm down here, I'm in my little world and I am who I am. Like, I'm not that, that person from New Jersey. I just want to take who I am now or who I've always been, but I'm starting to be able to be free of it and allow it to be seen in New Jersey because that's who I really am. I'm not that well, kid. New, New Jersey, the armor is a little different. So yes. in Virginia, you're going to go into acceptance <laughs> in New Jersey. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's basically, that's where my, uh, like, that's where like my, my second word is, is fuck. And my daughter, she's like, I am so like you. And I said, that's not the thing you should have gotten from me. <laughs> Do you want to hear something interesting? Um, it, it's funny, the connections on the Enneagram, I, I want to hear, I want to see your number. I think you're a type two for sure. Uh, type two is a big hearted helper when you're healthy. The, the, uh, unhealthy version when backed into a corner of a type two is they become like a type eight, which is the challenger type. Oh, the type eights are one of the most aggressive on the Enneagram. These are the loud, mean, fuck you, motherfucker. The, the tagline for a eight is fuck around and find out. Um, that is a side of me. I'm not going to lie. Like that is an unhealthy too. becomes yeah. a, a, gets, gets confused for a type eight all the time. Yeah. Cause I have the, um, I have, <laughs> I wish a fucker would, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm always like, I have 48 years of pent up rage. Let it happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. And I used to fight a lot. Like I would get in trouble with police cause I was 
I was the one that you didn't want to fuck around with because I didn't well, care you, who you were, what you, you were. Had the system that got attention from mm-hmm. doing crazy things. Though. Yeah, yeah, but I and that's part. I mean, yeah, there are still parts of me where I'm like that. That fuck around and find out is just so there. It's just so it's deep in, in me. Yeah, yeah. There, there's. I, I know where you're at. It's, it's. I see where you are. One thing I would challenge for you: you have a lot of people that want to give you advice, but not a lot of people that are your style. And so I would be leery of the advice that people give you for what you should do mm-hmm. when they're a different warrior type than you. And so you see oftentimes people who are mages or archers or people who are, you know, like cavalry trying to tell you to be what you are. And you're like, I'm a barbarian though. I don't <laughs> do any of those things, you know? Right. And so I'm a different warrior than you. You know, and so if your sword and shield and someone with bow and arrow is telling you, like, here's what you should do. You're like, that's not my warrior type. Mm-hmm. So when you're doing your processing and you're sorting your things, challenge authenticity as hard as you can, because other people will tell you to be what they think you should be. And a part of you wants to be that. Mm-hmm. But it will take you a lot longer to do what you're trying to do. Yes. I, and that's something else I've, I started to recognize, too, is as I, yeah, the, I'm not going to be what you want. I'm going to be what I want. And so, and that's okay. yeah, I started well, to, to recognize that too. As, as with the coming out with the sexual abuse, that's yeah. where it was, where I started to go, oh, well, you know, they're, they're, they're telling me, oh, because of this, this is how you probably should, whatever. And I'm like, eh, no, that's not me. Or. Or we're going to try doing it in a way that sounds like me, which means you're going to talk it out yeah, a lot. And what you'll actually need, and this is where like maybe a podcast wouldn't be the best place for this, but what you'll need (laughs) is someone who will shut the fuck up and just guide you kindly so you can go, well, is it this way? Is it that way? And you go, well, no, I thought about this way and I went into this thing and and I thought about this thing and it, it could be this, but I also know that this thing was there too. And then you'll work it out. And you don't need that person really to do a lot. Just listen. Yeah. And by the end of it, you'll go, okay, so I found this and I found this and I found this. And this thing right here is this thing. Oh, but that's connected to th- That's why I haven't been able to do it. And then you're like, thank you so much. And yeah. they'll go, you're welcome. Yeah, because you didn't do anything, <laughs> but I did it. But you just needed to listen. Yeah, I don't you have. Yes. Because, yeah, there, people need to just shut up. <laughs> well, for you, you need somebody who can handle the unload because it's a lot. It is. It is. And, and you know, I think that that's what kept me silent for so long is because I always was told it was so much. And it's, it's like. Just, you got to find the right person for that job, though. And it's not your husband. He'll be no. sweet with it, but we're not built for that. I yeah. Well, and that's the thing. You know what? It could never be him because I couldn't be authentic in. Let me rephrase that. Not that I'm trying to save you from it. I can't talk to him the way I could talk to somebody else who understands or relates. He, he'll tell you he had a, you know, a loving mom, loving dad, loving. So he can't relate to this. Correct. It definitely, I, and it's hard to find the people that are like yourself where you can, there's, I don't want to say, I hate when people say, oh, you're not going to shock me. I'm not here to shock you. I just want to tell you what the fuck was going on. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. and for me, I want you to be shocked in some way because I can't imagine other people have gone through the same shit I have, but knowing that that's not the truth, but it's almost no. as if you're, you know, you just need, like you said, it's like you have to find the right person who can the, not the be a shock it, factor. Though. The reality isn't a shock thing. Shocked is still when they're still thinking something's happening to them. Remember, at a higher level, when you're working with someone who's done some self-work, I don't feel shocked and I don't feel uh, any type of I need to guard myself or protect myself. I feel sad for that little girl. I feel sad for young you because, like, I'm a a protector, you know, and so it's one of those things when you hear the story, it's like everything in you wants to rescue you because that little girl had no business in those situations. And that's, that's the, the sadness that I have in there. And I don't, I don't want that to come off as me being like overly empathetic because no, it's not. I, get it. it's more yeah. like I want to protect you. And it breaks my heart that a little girl had to go through what you had to go through. Right. And that's where I'm at with this. This isn't some sort of like, like, you know, fuck them and they deserve to fucking die. It's like, man, if I could, if, if, 
you could just teleport in time. I'll go with you and we'll get you out of there. Yeah. Yeah. And those motherfuckers don't like when I'm there. I'm not as fun to fuck with as it may seem. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah. That's yeah. the part. It's, it's that, it's that, you know, protector, you know, I'm, I'm a leader amongst my, my, even my alphas and my men and we look out for each other. And when somebody's getting hurt like that, we want to band together and go, you do not get to hurt our pack. And mm -hmm. I would, yeah, that's just where I'm at. I hear the story and I just want to, I just want to be there for that little girl and go, let's get out of here. Yeah, me too. <laughs> mm. Well, you get to go do that. When you start doing some neuro-linguistic programming stuff and you start going back in and rewriting your history, um, you really do get to start doing that. And I've yeah. done that with quite a few people. But no, we can talk about that stuff on a different day because this goes off into a totally different psychology conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. But listen, we got a couple of hours in right now. I, let's, I'll tell you what. I think that if you got more in you, let's do another day. Yeah. But this was pretty cool because I see where you are in your journey. And I definitely commend you as a warrior because I see you fighting for what you are. You are actually, it's, here's the thing I see you fighting for. You're fighting to find you. And yeah. you're going to help as many people as you can on the journey of authenticity for discovering yourself. And I see where you are on your journey. You are on the right path. Keep going. Thank you. That means a lot. Yep. That's where I'm at. You're, you're on the right way. There's, there's a lot more mountain to go. Oh, yep. So keep the climbing top of one because... mountain is the bottom of another. Yep. You'll see. And yeah. then when you get jammed <laughs> up, you reach out to people like us who are like, I see where you're at. You, th don't go this way. Go this way. It'll save you two years of fucking things up. <laughs> I'll help you out. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. That's fun. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Denise Bard, for your authenticity, your vulnerability, and your courage. Thank you for sharing today. And cool. I feel like we'll do another one again, and then you can help some more people out. I am totally, and this was an incredible experience. You, you've opened my eyes to a lot of things. Nice. Well, thank you. And I appreciate you very much. Thank so you. let's, uh, let's end it there. And then we'll, uh, we will talk again soon. Okay. That sounds like an awesome plan. All right. <laughs>